friends. Welcome back to Old Fashioned On Purpose, the show where we explore what we have left behind as we have raced towards progress as a culture. But not only that, we also talk about how we can get all of the good pieces back into our lives as modern humans in 2024 and beyond. So I'm your host, Jill Winger. Uh, my family and I have been home sitting here out on the Wyoming Prairie since about 2008. So we were doing it before it was cool, if you will. Um, I'm an author, I'm a blogger, I'm a podcaster. And one of my biggest passions in life is helping people like you recapture some of the best parts of old fashioned living. So today's topic is a fun one. And it's also a, tends to be a very popular category here on the show. We're going to talk about a business option for you on your homestead. I think one of the biggest dreams when people start to dive into the homesteading lifestyle is, you know, how can I grow the food? How can I experience all the joy and the satisfaction from living in a more old fashioned way? But also, can I possibly help it pay for itself? Like, how is that going to work? How could I maybe be quit the nine to five or reduce the nine to five? Like, that's always the pain point I hear the most. And I have a really awesome idea for you to potentially make your own today. And I am joined by the one and only Marjorie Wildcraft to help present this idea to you in this episode. You've probably heard her name before. She is the founder of the Grow Network, which is a community of people focused on modern self-sufficient living. She's been featured in National Geographic. She hosted the Mother Earth Online Homesteading Summit. Um, she's authored a book called The Grow System. She has done it all. And Marjorie, I am so excited for this conversation today. Nice. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. It's uh, it's always a pleasure. You and I have a, a really good vibe together. So yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think was it last year? It was one of your grow summits that we I came on. We talked about food preservation. It was a, it was a great conversation. That was that was awesome. Yeah. I think yeah. I think you you've posted that so people can listen to that. Yeah. I did. Yeah. And we can we'll grab some links and, and stuff. There'll be good stuff in the show notes, guys. So go check it out um, when you're done listening. But. Give us a little background before we get into this business plan, if you will, kind of how you got into this world of growing food, why you're so passionate about this, um, a little bit of background. Yeah. So first of all, I was not born to hippie parents in the commune or anything like that. And we never grew any food. I grew up in a subdivision. And same. Uh, actually my- Same. Yeah, right. Yep. So I'm not, you know, I, I discovered and created this life just like you and almost everybody listening is doing, right? Uh, and actually, I had been a professional real estate investor, um, and my business was doing very well, and the model I was using um, was doing very well. In fact, it was so well that um, uh, Robert Kiyosaki asked me to be the lead testimonial on his infomercials for Time Life products. Oh so gosh. I was on national television for like four years in a row on a couple of infomercials for him for Rich Dad, Poor Dad stuff. And I was loving, I mean, you know, making money hand over fist and, and just having fun. And I was volunteering on a project to get locally grown food into uh, a small elementary school, had no idea that my life was going to do a complete, you know, 180 and completely change. And what, what happened, the project was a complete failure. And I mean, really an utter failure and it failed because we realized there were not enough farmers producing locally grown food in all of the county to provide vegetables for even one small rural elementary school. And, you know, Texas has some big counties and I was just outside of Austin, which is, you know, kind of a progressive area. Right. Um, and it just, I just couldn't stop shaking. I, I had nightmares. I had, I had panic attacks. Um, I, I just like, cause I knew there was only four days worth of food in the grocery stores and inventory mm -hmm. at any given time. The 1500 miles is how far stuff gets trucked in. And then I'm surrounded by at that time, it is more now 20 million Texans who are armed to the teeth. And it is true in Texas, everybody's got guns, you yep. know, yep. several guns, you know, there's like 10 guns per person in Texas. And I just, I just really, I, I really, whatever, you know, people want the wake up call from God or you want the direct, and you know, that's how it came to me. And I, I said, okay, that's it. So I sold the real estate business, put up with all the people who said, you're crazy, Marjorie, there's never going to be any supply chain problem. Whoops. I don't Oops. know if you hear that in the background. I live in, I can. Uh, okay. I live in Puerto Rico and this place is oh, noisy. Okay. I love it, okay. but it is noisy. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, for growing seasons, you can't beat it. But, I mean, I'm um, just saying that's a I, it's a trade off, man. I, 
I'd take it. It's all good. <laughs> so Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um there are quiet areas, by the way. Um yeah, so I just said that's it. And you know, I did have a lot of people who were like Marjorie, like my sister in law, I loved her to death, but she was like, You're crazy. She said, This the United States of America. We ain't never gonna have any supply chain problem. Then we're never gonna have empty store empty shelves on the groceries, you know. Like I'm like, okay, but I know what I know and I I feel what I feel and I feel mm. that this is the most important thing I can do with my life energy. And so I just went like a mad woman on learning how to grow food, you know, how to food for us and animals and uh, wild crafting and foraging and, you know, even all the weird stuff like eating insect and, you know, like, you know, just how do you survive when, when times are really, really, really tough and hoping that we never got to that. And um, yeah, and then eventually, of course, the, the first thing you realize when you start growing food is you can't do it on your own. It requires a community. Yeah. So started teaching other people and building community. And then one thing led to another. And um, <laughs> that was how the Grow Network was born. And yeah, and you know, I, I will, I'll give you the, what do they call it when you, when you give away the punchline at the end? The, uh, uh, anyway, um, <laughs> I am so glad that happened because I love growing food and I love working with the earth and the animals and I'm so grounded and so happy and I have a sense of security that you will never be able to buy with insurance, <laughs> you know, so, and health that you cannot buy from the medical complex. So, um, it's just a fantastic life. And I, I know, you know, that, and everybody listening is starting to touch that or get into that in some way or another. And, um, so that's, that's how I got into it. Yeah. I, I didn't know that actually. Um, I, I love that you are a self-made woman. Like you created what you wanted. It wasn't your background. I feel like all too often, especially in agriculture, there's this perception that you have to be born into it or you get leg up by being born into it. And I'm always like, Hey, you know, it's cool if you have five generations behind you, but you don't have to, like you can create what you want to have. And I think you're an amazing example of that. You know, I think in some ways we actually have an advantage not knowing anything because yeah. You know, uh, it's like Joel Salatin, he doesn't build a lot of permanent buildings because he wants his kids to be able to redesign and reconfigure in whatever way is for the time that suits them. So, yes, um, you know, agriculture in some ways is still the basic thing for 10,000 years. But in other ways, you know, we've got new materials uh, and, you know, new new ad and, and we have access to all of world's information. So new ideas can come to us from anywhere. So. Uh, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a, a process of learning, <laughs> but yes. in some ways we can, we can innovate that, that you can't when you're stuck in what we've always done it this way. Right. So, yes. Yeah. Which is such a fallacy in agriculture, especially, but in all of life. But yeah. Um, when I do see the generational operations, sometimes when it's like, I want to do it this way, but dad and grandpa don't. And it's, we've always done it. I'm like, Oh, that's, that'd be tough. That, I mean, a different set of problems, but a, a tough set of problems. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So let's get into the nitty gritty. Um, I love this title that you sent over for the, for, we were talking about potential topics for this episode and you're like the seven hour business to fund your backyard farming. That is intriguing. So give us kind of the high level view. What is that? And then we're going to get into all of the details so people can put it into action. Well, I, I guess the biggest high level I've got to start out with is the entire planet's geopolitical system. <laughs> you know, um, you know, quite frankly, we're, we're headed into a famine. We're headed into hyperinflation and currency collapse. Uh, we have the banking system is just on, I don't know how they're keeping it afloat, but it's teetering. We have that multi-trillion, good billion. There's lots of these big words for even bigger numbers. Derivatives bubble. I mean, uh, we, we've got, uh, we got a huge amount of problems and everybody's life is going to change very, very dramatically. I've spent a lot of time studying collapse situations, either interviewing people uh, going like I went to Cuba or spending time with people who had lived through the Argentinian collapse or reading a lot of historical stuff, Weimar, Germany, civil war. The bottom line is food becomes the biggest issue. And yes. so learning how to grow food and then then, you know, the currency, when the currency collapsed, the next best thing is 
anything related to food becomes extremely valuable. So the food itself becomes valuable, but then like tools and especially seeds become really, really valuable. So, um, you know, if we were talking about this a couple of years ago, this wouldn't have been as big a potential income stream as it is now and as going to be. And I think, I think, Jill, you, uh, most of us have seen this, you know, during uh, 2020 when that whole uh, COVID experience unrolled. I mean, you could not buy seeds anywhere. They were right, gone, right. right? Everybody yep, just, yep. They just bought them all. Uh, I, I think the, the next experience that we're heading into is going to be far worse than that uh, because you could eventually get seeds. And I don't think at some point in time that that availability is going to be as readily or quick. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, in, do, does, it, does it even make sense to talk about dollars anymore? No. <laughs> and are you going to make a living, a complete living off of, of growing and, and saving and selling seeds? Probably not. Any small farm, any homestead, you really need about 10 different income streams right. from everything, you know, from selling some seeds or fixing this or selling those excess tomatoes or you know, the milk from the goats or whatever. I mean, it, it, it has to be multiple, but this is one really, uh, viable stream of income, or at least an item to barter and trade with that are extremely valuable. The other high level thing to look at it from is, you know, one tomato plant, huge number of seeds, right? The seeds are really abundant, you know, one squash, right? There's a lot that comes out of it. So, uh, it's not going to take a lot of room, um, and you can you can totally make it happen. Yeah, I think what you said is such it's such an important point that it does take multiple income streams. Like I see, I get so many people coming to me, and I've talked about it on the show before. They're like, I want to fund my homestead. I'm going to sell soap. I'm going to quit my job and sell soap. And I'm like, Oof. honey, <laughs> like have I love you looked the at the ex- margins the on drive. that? <laughs> Your right, margin yeah. is not going to work. It's going to make you, you're going to lose a lot of sleep and it's not going to be great. So I think, you know, soap's a piece of it. Um, seeds are a piece of it. Maybe you sell seedlings, maybe you sell milk, maybe you sell vegetables. But I think it's, this is a part of a multi-tiered approach to just funding your backyard farming, like you said in the title. That's so. that's also just the nature of the times we're going into. Honestly, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, and I'm usually pretty good at seeing trends and understanding and, um, you know, where things are moving. I, you know, I've actually made way more money as a professional investor than I ever did with a grow network. (laughs) You know, like the grow network has really been like a lifelong passion project at this point, but I have no idea what we're headed into now. I really, there are so many things that could happen in so many different ways. And we have so many forces in contention. And so having multiple streams of anything is a good idea. You know, you want to have your food supplies, you want to have your weapons, you want to have your medicines, you want to have, you you know, you need to have all of your stuff. You, you really need to have multiple of everything uh, going on and backups and redundancies. So uh, in general, that's just a good, because we, we just don't know what's going to work and what isn't. Mm-hmm. And I think this is one of those examples. And these are my favorite things to invest in skill-wise, because it's going to be extremely valuable if something goes down, right? We like a, we had a little taste of it during COVID. Like all the homestead skills that a lot of us had been building were super nice to have. We had our grain mills already. We knew how to handle our flour. We had our eggs. We didn't have to worry about the grocery store shortages. So it was massively beneficial then. But even if something isn't collapsing, it's still beneficial. Like it's still a good yes. thing. It's still a healthy thing. It's going to save you money. It's going to make you happier. It's going to make your food supply better. So it's a win-win regardless of what society may or may not be doing. Uh, absolutely. And the mindset also of like, Hey, you know, um, I'm, I am preparing for some major changes and if they don't mm-hmm. come great, but I'm I pretty much can guarantee you we've got 2024 is going to be a year for the record books. It's, it's just, there's just so much lining up that they can't put off anymore. So <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. What's well, a wild time to be alive for sure. For sure. It's an honor. It's an honor yes. to get to live yes. through this for such a time as this. Um, okay. So basics, what do we need to know to get started saving seeds? We've talked about that a little bit on the podcast in the past. It's been a while. So let's get into the ins and outs of seed saving. 
Yeah, let's let's drill it down into something really simple. Three. God, don't we just love three rules? I love uh, three. It's my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> uh, dark, dry, and cool, right? So mm-hmm. when you're saving your seeds, dark, dry, and cool. And actually, as a homesteader saving seeds, you do not need a lot of room, right? And I'm going to show you my favorite container for saving seeds in. And that is uh, just an old-fashioned ammunition container. Can this one's oh, a plastic awesome. one? I also like the uh, 50 millimeter ones that the uh, U.S. military uses for ammunition. Um, okay, and this is great. This is actually waterproof. Um, you know, you can easily yes. move it around. It's also stackable. One of one of my favorite uh, containers. And you you are going to want to store your seeds well. So that makes the and you uh, first of all that's just the container part, right? Mm-hmm. Um, dry. When you've got it in there, especially if you live in a humid climate like Puerto Rico, yes. um, cat litter is a great desiccant. You know, you can buy expensive desiccants, but I'll take a, like a handful of cat litter and put it in a sock and throw it in there with it. It helps to absorb the moisture. Idea. But you want to keep it dry. Uh, dark, you know, obviously that's a dark, it's a dark container. So having it somewhere in a closet or a cupboard or something like that. And cool. So you... Um, don't want to put this on top of the refrigerator, right? That's That's got sure. heat coming out of it. You don't want to put it near the stove. You know, you put it somewhere. You don't want to put it where it's going to be in direct sunlight. People sometimes like to save their seeds in the greenhouse. That's not a good idea, you know. Um, so the, the very simple answer to saving seeds, which you need to know, is cool, dry, cool, dry and dark. Um, another way to think of it is a seed is a little tiny living thing. I know so many of us are used to commodities like, ah, uh, you know, here's a, a phone or a whatever, you know. Um, they're actually alive and you need to preserve that life as much as possible. And, and cool, dry and dark is going to help that life be extended. What about putting them in the freezer or the refrigerator? I have people ask about that. That was going to be my next thing is don't absolutely don't put it in the freezer. (laughs) You know, I used to think I, I, man, one year I grew this amazing crop of corn. I was going to save the seed from it and I did, and I put it in the freezer. Um, and there are, you know, we've heard about the swallows uh, seed way up like next to Santa Claus, somewhere up there in the North pole. Yes. Um, frozen thick all the time. They have to really, really prepare those seeds very carefully because seeds do contain some moisture. And when you get below freezing, water expands. And uh, for most of us, we aren't going to be able to get the exact amount of dryness so that we, like I destroyed my seeds basically. And I, th- I had them pretty dang dry. When I put them in the freezer though, none of them None of them made it. So I do not recommend putting them in the freezer. Now, in the refrigerator, yeah, in, in the back of a refrigerator, again, in a sealed tight um, compartment, because refrigerators can be pretty moist sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's a good idea. Yeah, for refrigeration is great. Actually, the latest thing that I've been experimenting with is taking a chest freezer and buying an external thermostat and operating it as like a, not as a freezer, but as a, as mm-hmm. a low temperature, like a refrigerator, and that's been great for storage. So it never gets below, say, 35 degrees in there. Um, and I've been storing some things in there that I need to, especially seeds, that I need to keep cool, but I don't want frozen. Um, most of your freezers aren't going to do that. You have to buy an external thermostat. And it's a pretty simple thing. You plug it in, just... Whoops. Sorry about that. Look no it worries. up on YouTube or ask Jill later. <laughs> yes, yeah. No worries. Yeah, no, that's... And I think that's pretty easy to find. I've seen people in the homestead space, use things like that. So it should be an easy Google search to find something that would work. Yeah. Just don't yeah. let it freeze. So don't good. let it freeze. Okay. Good to know. Cause I know freezers always everyone's kind of first inclination. Um, yeah. How about like, let's just like really go back to basics. Um, and I'm going to, pr- I'll play devil's advocate a little bit. Like someone, uh, you know, someone has no familiarity with this topic. Can you save seeds from any plants? Like, can I just get seeds from Walmart and save seeds from the produce that comes from them? Like, what do I need to know about my starting uh, seeds? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that gets into the GMO, hybrid, heirloom, open pollinated. There's Those are the different categories of seeds that are available. Um, I have, actually, I, I often get genetics from the farmer's market. 
you know, I go to small producers there and these tomatoes taste great. And I just go ahead and save the seeds from those tomatoes and grow them. I often ask them, I'm like, Hey, uh, you know, what did you grow these from? Let, let's go over those first distinctions though. So, so that way it can help set the categories of, of what you can and can't save. Um, GMO, obviously that's something that's been manipulated and manufactured in a lab and you're going to want to avoid those seeds. <laughs> those yes. seeds are most likely going to be like the whole grain that you buy at the grocery store. Uh, they're often genetically modified. So you are probably not going to want to use them like whole wheat or something like that at the store that they're in the bulk bins. They're probably genetically modified. So that's not going to be good. Um, heirloom uh, uh, hybrid seeds are seeds that have been specially bred to produce that one time a particular uh, product, like uh, there'll be hybrid tomatoes or hybrid squash. Um, and uh, actually a lot of organic farmers, believe it or not, use hybrid seeds because they, when they breed them to create it, they're, they're creating, uh, they're trying to reduce, you know, or increase disease resistance or increase yield. Um, it's kind of like, what is it? Mating a donkey with a horse. I was just thinking of that. Yes. Or a mule. uh, Yeah. yeah, It makes a mule. Yeah. But exactly. It makes a mule. Right. Mm -hmm. And a mule is a pretty good animal. It's, 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 uh, you know, but that mule can't reproduce. So, uh, that's what hybrid seeds are about. And, and a lot of times they, for, for, you know, organic farmers or farmers that uh, really need to, you know, like they're de- doing this, they need to depend on this for their living. They don't necessarily want to plant heirlooms because they may take longer. They might have more other yeah. problems or issues, whereas the hybrids do tend to be much more produ- production focused. Now, you can save the seeds from the hybrids. The only thing is, is it's a little bit of a crapshoot of what's going to come out. We just don't know uh, sure. because it's a hybrid. Um uh, and you just don't know what is is it, what it's going to be. Um, they usually actually do produce something, uh, believe it or not. They usually are viable seeds, but um, uh, it's it's not a good idea to to save the seeds from those. So, by the way, um, some of the seeds uh, in the commercial industry, they believe it or not, they insert a gene called the terminator gene, which uh, so when they sell the corn to the big commercial farmers. They can only grow one crop and they can't save the seed from it because that's all it will ever grow. And if they try to save seed from the crop, it's been designed not to be able to reproduce. Isn't that, I just find that so horrifying. Like they just, it's it's just awful. Breaking that cycle. I I was reading a book the other day about something else and they were saying, you know, we've taken the circle of life and turned it into a straight line. And I was like, oh, that was so good and so true and sad. But that reminds me of that. So heirloom and open pollinated heirloom are seeds that actually almost, well, actually all pretty much of our varieties of of vegetables come from your great, great grandparents, right? All of the seed varieties we have are your great, great grandparents, right? They they were the ones that had, you know, the the kitchen garden, they were growing, they were living this lifestyle and, and they saved seeds and kept them back and, and, and did it. So heirloom seeds generally have been around for, I don't know, at least. 50 years, 100 years or more. Uh, So they're older, um, usually really good varieties. And uh, we've lost a lot, oddly enough. I think I've I've seen different studies. Some say 90% and some say 70%. We've lost a lot because we aren't continually growing them and saving them. And a lot of them were grown for particular uses. Like we grew this variety of squash because it, it stayed... Uh, it stayed through the winter and didn't, you know, turn into a pile of mush by December. You know, we could still mm-hmm. eat squash, the winter squash. We could still eat it in, in March. Or, you know, we grew this tomato because it was really good for canning. And we grew this one because it was really good for taste. You know, all the different things. Those are, those are all heirloom varieties. And those are great. Again, the heirloom varieties may take longer uh, to produce than, than the, say, the hybrids. Um, but, you know, really, that's really what we want to be focusing on. Um, the other is open pollinated and open pollinated means that it was, um, you know, a, a, a group of squash was grown and they were pollinated naturally through the flowers and the bees and the whole cycle. Uh, and that they will come, the, the open pollinated and the heirloom do come true to seed. So that way, when you plant those again, when you collect those seeds and save them, you will get that same squash or tomato or cucumber or whatever it was initially. Uh, and, um, open pollinated may be newer. 
uh, you know, not necessarily, they're not necessarily heirlooms, but both of those categories are, are, are what we're going to, what we're going to want to focus on. So um, most of the things in your grocery stores are going to be genetically modified or hybrid. Uh, so you're not going to want to do that. I really, I do get a lot of genetics going to the farmer's market and asking the farmers, you know, this is really great. You know, uh, there's the, they have here in Puerto Rico, they have the calabasas, there's these gigantic squashes. And I'm like, did you, you know, was this grown around other squashes? Uh, yeah. Is, did you grow this yourself? You know, what variety is this? You know, you know what I mean? And, and they're, they're, they're usually pretty straight up with you. I've gotten some really great tomato seed from there, uh, curry plants, um, yeah, just lots of different seeds that I've gotten from buying the produce there. A lot of there's a lot of exotic fruits here, and we'll save the seeds from those and grow the trees, granabanas. So yeah. honestly, that's for me been a great source, and plus it's local. <laughs> like you know, yeah, right. You, you know, yeah. Um, and most seed catalogs they they will let you know if it's it's hybrid or GNO or open pollinated or uh, heirloom, and. Um, I'm, I'm sure you have lists. We can also send folks lists of mm-hmm. seed companies that we recommend. Yeah. One here I'll just give one. a shout out to uh true leaf market. I, it was, yeah. <laughs> it was a nice little segue. Yeah. That's who I use. There's a lot of good ones, but true leaf um, has a lot of heirlooms, a lot of open pollinated, a really good variety. And so if you guys are looking for a good option, um, go check them out. It's the prairie homestead.com slash seeds. We'll drop that in the show notes as well. But um yeah, they're a good place to start. Uh, but I also, Marjo, I love that idea of just going to the farmer's market because in, in essence, you're getting those seeds for free. That's a sweet idea. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So we have our seeds. Um, now what? <laughs> what do you do next? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about, about actual getting the seeds. Uh, and so first of That's all. That's true. Yeah. We skipped over uh, some space big pieces is, there. <laughs> space is not a, yeah, space is not a real big issue. You think about one tomato plant, you have got so many seeds and, and which seeds do you want? Well, if you want to, um, you know, focus on early varieties, you know, p- the, the ones that, and you may save seeds, like well, tomatoes, everybody loves tomatoes, right? We'll have to talk about tomatoes. You yes. know, the, the first tomatoes that come out will save those seeds and, uh, you know, and, and then mark those, my early tomato seeds, right? Or, you know, um, uh, this one was super flavorful, you know, that. But if you think, you know, there's so many seeds, like in one tomato, there's like, like a gazillion seeds, right? You know, so you, there's lots of seeds and you don't even need to necessarily, um, um, uh, you know, do much different from what you're already doing for harvesting. I remember one time helping a farmer uh, harvest a bunch of squash for the seeds. It was a, a seed company and we were shelling out all that was a, these wonderful little banana squashes. And he was having me scrape out all the seeds into a big pile. And then we had all the squashes left over and he went and we loaded that up into a truck and gave it to a food bank. Um, but there's, you know, that's still good food, right? And you have plenty of seeds. Some distinctions and things you'll need to learn about. There are some seeds that are really easy to grow. They're self-pollinated like tomatoes, right? Really easy to grow. They, you don't have to worry about a lot about cross-pollination or problems. Some of the more difficult things are squashes, you know, the cucubits. There's, there's like three different varieties of squashes that uh, if you, you can grow the three of them together as long as they're all uh, in different lineages, but if you tend to grow two squashes together, they like really cross pollinate easily and you may not, yes. you're not really going to have seed that comes true to seed. Uh, and so for example, people that really want to grow a lot of squash, sometimes they'll do it in a greenhouse just to isolate it. Uh, some things are wind pollinated like corn. Uh, and you know, you want to make sure that you only have that one corn patch there. Uh, if you have another corn patch that's too close, it can cross pollinate, they wind pollinate. So you're going to want to learn which ones are are basic. The easiest ones to start with are tomatoes and beans and lettuce. These are are really um, some of the easiest ones. But that as you get into this, that's going to be a skill that you're going to want to learn more about. Is is um, what what you know? Does the, how easily does this cross pollinate? And how far away do I need to have something to make sure I've got this isolated so that this is going to come back? true to seed. By the way, this is something you want to know as a homesteader in general anyway, as there will be a time coming pretty soon when you're going to need to save your own seeds. Also, um, 
it's pretty unrealistic to think that you're going to be able to save seed from everything, right? It really is unrealistic to expect that you're going to be able to save seed from every one of your vegetables. And that's one of the reasons we have community is, yes. you know, I save seeds from this, that, and the other. And so-and-so saves seeds from um, Y, Z, and Z. And then, you know, we know and we trade and we share. Again, it's sort of like for, for the squashes, right? You know, I'll grow this kind, you grow that kind. We live a mile apart. That's great. Yes. You know? yes. <laughs> totally. Um, could you just give, and I know the techniques for each variety varies widely, but just kind of basic rule of thumb, like let's say we wanted to save seeds from, um, let's say beans or lettuce, like how would someone go about doing that? Those, since those are some of the easier ones. Yeah, the beans are great. So most beans, let's like, like take your standard green beans, right? You know, they when they're green, you can just eat them as green beans. And if you just let them dry on the, on the stalk, then that's fine. And then you shell them and you've got them. They're like one of the easiest ones to save seeds from. Uh, and green beans, actually, that will probably happen to you by accident, just that when they yes. get going, man, they're really <laughs> prolific and they're harder. There'll be that one in the back that's hiding from yep. you, and it, you know, and if you don't harvest them regularly, then the next thing you know, you've got a whole bunch of seed and the thing quits producing. <laughs> it says, right. hey, I did my right. job, right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, th those are the super easy ones. Uh, lettuce again, a lot of people just as it's, you know, when it, you let a few of them bolt, which is means they, they go to flower. And uh, a lot of people will take like a, after it's really got the flower and it's just about to go, they'll often put like a, a paper bag over the plant uh, just to be able to catch uh, the seed uh, rather than just having it, you know, get, cause they're pretty small. Lettuce seeds are, are pretty small. Yes. So tomato seeds are, are kind of fun in that they're real mucilaginous and you put them in just a little bit of water and you let them ferment. And then that mucilaginous coating will drop off or, or flow mm -hmm. to the top and the seeds will drop and, they're pretty easy to separate out. It's it's not a hard process. I'm I'm sure Jill has shown you how to do that before. So each yeah, yeah each one is a little bit different. Um, um, but it's all you know. These are all skills that are easy to learn and figure out. Um, one of the things I was really surprised about, and maybe people know this already, but like most of the food we're eating from our garden is a little bit young. And so you you're going to be saving, kind of like you mentioned with the beans, you're going to be saving seeds from things that are past their prime for eating most of the time, like the bolted lettuce, the dried out beans, the tomatoes that are really ripe. Um, that's, I think that's true pretty much across the board. Wouldn't you say with seed saving, you're waiting until that really far along in that maturity process? Yeah. Or, well, other things like squashes, the seeds are, are good. And that's then of course true. you can also yeah. eat the seeds. Like I, I remember visiting the Taramara Indians in, in uh, Mexico and that was like a little snacks. They roasted the seeds and seeds and just had them out you can just eat them and, and spit mm -hmm. the shells out. And, um, but yeah, most of them are you like cucumbers. You're going to get a little old, right? And you know, yeah. that's okay. You know, so just leave a couple of plants that, uh, that, uh, you know, that let it go to seed. <laughs> yep. Yep. I know it's, it's, it takes a little discipline, but it, yeah, it doesn't take, like you said, it doesn't take a lot to get a lot of seeds. So you can just have a, a plant or two. So you're not waiting. It's not like you're wasting it. Um, do you have any experiment experience with, cabbage seed saving? Cause I've looked at it in some books and I'm like, Oh, this seems really complicated. Have you tried it? I, I have. And you do the, the, you do the classic thing where you like, as the cabbage is getting really mature, you cut an X in the top of it so it can come out and bolt. Mm, okay. And then it's the same thing. You put a, like a paper bag over it to catch, uh, those seeds. So, okay. um, one of the hardest ones I found actually was tobacco. Man, those seeds are minuscule. I couldn't even see them. So I'm just like, I'll get tobacco seedlings from other yeah. people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What about carrots? Have you tried carrot seed saving? I have not done carrot seed saving. Okay. Yeah. That's another one. It feels that, like that might have a layer of complexity as well. I haven't looked into it much, but. You know, yeah. there's a, we can also get into some um, durations of um what uh, seed uh, viability. So, um, you yeah, know, we've all heard, that. yeah, you know, we've all heard about in Egypt, they, they've dug out a tomb and then there's these wheat seeds from, uh, you know, that's been buried for thousands of years and they're still viable. And that is true. But if you think about it in Egypt, they have the perfect conditions in that tomb. It's going to be cool. 
dark and dry and it didn't get below freezing. Right. So, right. And wheat and a lot of these grains are very amenable to being saved and for many, many years, but there are other seeds that do not have that kind of viability. And I think onion seeds are the fastest, like (laughs) onion seeds are just like within a year, you're you're not, you're not going to do that again. Right. Actually, most of the time I like to propagate my onions from just cutting off the roots and starting a new, you know, or, or getting the, yeah. um, getting the, the, the scallions already from somebody who knows how to do that. <laughs> I have a hard time, like onions from seed. I've tried so many years and I'm like, this is, doesn't feel did, worth it. <laughs> no, yeah, no, I get the bunches of, you know, the bunches that come with the root and the little shoot and just yep. put them in the Same. ground. And yeah, actually more and more now I just get the scallions that kind of reproduce everywhere. And I don't even do the bulbing onions anymore. Cause I can just mm. cut these scallions and they're, Man, those are such great plants. Like they don't die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love plants that don't die, right? Yes. Um, so a lot of other seeds though are going to be kind of in there and m- most of them, that's why there's, there are, when you get your seed packet, they will tell you when they were packed. And generally you're going to see, um, like a, a 10 to 20% drop off in germination every year, uh, depending on, on which seeds you have. And it really is true. You know, after five years, some of those seeds are not, most of those seeds are not going to be viable. Um, And a real quick way to do a a germination test is to just, you know, get 10 or 20 of those seeds and put them on a wet napkin and put them in a little jar or Tupperware thing to keep them kind of moist and see how many of them sprout. (laughs) It's pretty simple. Smart smart idea. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Way before you try. I also, I'm a big fan with a lot of things. I, I like this one, the whole John Jevons method where I, I tend to like to do all my stuff in small containers before, and then transplant it out to the garden. That way I know I've got a good viable start going rather than direct seeding. I, there's some things I direct seed like beans and whatever, because they're just so big and they don't actually like to be transplanted. But a lot of things I like, cause, and it also maximizes the use of my garden space. Like I'm not waiting forever for a bunch of seeds, um, that may or may not. That's, that's not always true, but, um, uh, anyway, that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> no, but I like, I, and I've been doing that more and more. I used to be like, oh, I can direct see this, but like you said, sometimes you end up waiting and then you realize, oh, the viability wasn't good. Something happened. And now I'm two or three weeks behind and I have to start over. So I think it is so smart to do your germination tests, start stuff in containers ahead of time, if you can. Um, and you're going to set yourself up for success that much more. In a lot of bioregions, like when I was in Colorado, you would not have tomatoes if you did not start them Same. in a greenhouse yeah. ahead of time, right? There's a lot of places yes. where, where that's just the case. So, um, yeah. Some things I do like, and I, I like turnips, man. I love turnips, and I would just spray all those seeds out there, and then and then uh, I would eat the, eat the young greens as a part of thinning, mm-hmm. and that was kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, that works too. Yeah, yeah, that works. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so we we've got the right seeds. We have grown the plant. We have harvested the seeds. We, we're storing them properly. How do we get into the business side of this and make it make sense? Yeah, so you're gonna marketing, marketing, marketing. So let's see. I have some. Um, I have some little envelopes, and um, little envelopes are terrible. Like you should look at Baker Creek seeds, man. Those guys, Jer Gettle, and those guys. Yeah. They send you like a friggin', you know, like a huge envelope and it's got like 15 seeds in it, you know, and then they've got these beautiful pictures on it and all that. Now they are a big seed retailer, right? Um, uh, But mostly where I've done, and I honestly have never sold seeds because I tend to just give everything away, but really the places you would do that would be at your, your gardening club or um, you know, at, at, at flea markets or, you know, if you're hosting events, like one of the best ways to sell stuff I always found was when I was hosting an event in my yard, like maybe I'm teaching how to butcher rabbits or teaching how to transplant trees or something like that. And then we have a table with, you know, seeds that we've grown and other things. Interestingly enough, people love Mora knives. We would always sell out of oh. Mora knives. <laughs> so yeah, that's what, that's what the kids are for is to man the table. Yeah. Um, uh, I, you know, really, this is not going to be something you're, you, you're not going to be doing a big business on this. Um, so, you know, you're not going to want to set up the website and do the whole thing. Another possibility though. And again, this is, I did an interview with Jer Gettle a few years ago 
And regional seed companies do need seeds. Uh, and if you get really good and consistent at producing a particular variety and you start doing it in quantity, they will buy it from you wholesale. So that's a whole nother option so that you don't have to worry about that marketing or the direct uh, uh, sales thing. So, um, and I really want to encourage more and more regional seed companies to, to start coming into existence. My understanding of, oh, by the way, I host a plant and seed swap party every two months. And that's another way that I'm getting a lot of genetics and a lot of uh, uh, new plants. And this is more of just a free thing where we just mm-hmm. find a place. There's a local cafe and we let everybody know, which unfortunately now is through Facebook. And people show up with plants and seeds and we just we just uh, swap them. Um, to me, that's like a form of barter, right? I'm so I brought these seeds and somebody gives me those and whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you, the regional seed companies do want seeds from you uh and then you can sell them and i'm really envisioning where we are uh the currency is is on its way out the u.s dollar (laughs) if you haven't heard let me be the first to tell you (laughs) the petrodollar died in august of last year when uh, saudi arabia joined the BRICS (laughs) coalition so you know that packet of seed will be a form of currency for Mm -hmm. other things that are useful so yeah um, do you have any tips for in the, just like the current economy price, how someone would know how to price their seeds? Well, you know, take a look at, I'm, I've been astonished at how much seeds cost these days. I mean, to get a little envelope of seeds is about three or $4 at most places. Mm-hmm. So, and there's not that much in there, by the way, here's another idea for you. If you want to uh, get into this is um, you can buy seeds in wholesale, like uh, Johnny's right here, you know, and buy a pound of seeds this is actually a way you could fund your own seed acquisition. Buy a pound of whatever it is, turnips or whatever, repackage it into the smaller ones and sell those off. And you could do, there's other ways, also Craigslist, you know, other, you know, Carden Club, whatever. Um, and the markup is is pretty high. So you think mm-hmm. about it, you, you're selling these little $3, $4 packets of turnip seeds. And then, but the pound only cost you maybe $15 or $20. Astonishing how much, uh, you can get when you buy a larger, um, a larger quantity. So yes. that's another option for just a small uh, business to do. In fact, a lot of homeschooling families, I've seen them do that and they, they buy it in bulk. The kids divide it up. They, they make their own packaging and then the kids sell it as like homeschooling projects at different events and fairs, um, which we can do too. Yeah. That's a great idea. And I think, you alluded to it a minute ago, like just, even if you're just funding your own food production, like if that's your first goal is okay, I'm selling enough. I'm not going to make a million dollars on it, but I'm selling enough to cover what I, my family and I are eating. Like that's huge, especially in our day and age where grocery stores are rising in price. Um, that's a great first metric. And then if you add another little things, like we've had people on the show in the past talk about, you know, selling seedlings and using that as a business opportunity or microgreens. And like, you just add those little pieces in and pretty soon you're going to be not only covering what you're eating, but then some, and I think that's, um, really where that core of that dream of self-sufficiency lies. I, I really recommend that approach. As I said, in the beginning, multiple streams of income is, is going to be the way to, is going to be the way to go. So yeah. 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 I love it. Um, so as we kind of wrap up here, that was a fast, holy moly, fast 45 minutes to flew by. <laughs> Any other information you want to leave with our guests? I also want you to share in a minute your, um, you have a resource that's a really helpful in this realm of, of content, but any other last bits of advice or wisdom yes. for folks who want to do this? Yeah. So another thing is, is there really is a dire need in your bioregion for things that do well in your bioregion? Cause so much has become centralized that we, you know, we really do need the genetics more localized, right? There's uh, stories in Texas of these two brothers that grew this corn in their horrible soil year after year, and they kept pulling out the best ones and saving the seed. And then they developed a, a variety of corn that would grow in totally crap soil in totally crazy weather in South Texas. Yeah. I want to talk about an incredibly valuable seed. I mean, that was yes. incredible. Also, there's a whole legacy component to this. Um, my father-in-law, um, he grew a, he figured out a tomato. He's, he's, he's always, he's, he's at a salad bar. He goes, that was a good tomato. And he'll grab another one and save the seeds. He's kind of funny. You know, he said, 
<laughs> Denny's or something like that. And he manages to yeah. collect seeds. <laughs> anyway, he developed a porter tomato that would grow in the heat really well, which is a huge thing. It didn't taste that great. But any tomato in the middle of summer in Texas is a huge deal, right? And we call them Popsis Porter. And those seeds have been kept by the family and saved down and saved down. And every year that I grow them, we, we talk about Pops. And it's legacy. It's legacy yes. work. And, yes. uh, you know, I've interviewed a lot of baby boomers or a lot of older people. And I said, what's your, what's your favorite memory, your favorite childhood memory? And I can even tell you mine is when I was with my Aunt Julia and my Aunt Linda up in uh, Mount Pocono. They had a place up there. We went there for the summer. And uh, Aunt Julia had an apple tree in her yard. And we gathered the apples and made applesauce. It always involves harvesting and preparing food. It does. I have noticed that as well. Like every time it's always around food. Yep. It always is. I went collecting eggs with grandpa or yes. I dug potatoes with my uncle Ralph. You know, it, it always involves food. So, um, yep. and, and what you're doing here is, is legacy work. And we really do need to revive a lot of these genetics. As I said, we've lost a whole bunch, yes. but you know, just like pigs, right? You know, they grow these pigs in the commercial system. They don't have any fat on them. And like right. fat is the most important. Like I want a fat pig. <laughs> I bought a pig from a local farmer. It was like mostly fat. I was like, yay. Yes. Somebody said, I hate his pigs. They're all fatty. And I said, you got the wrong attitude, you know? Yep. So yep. yes, but so developing these genetics, uh, it's, it's legacy work. It's important work. When you're doing that, you're adding a whole nother layer of meaning and importance to what you're doing. Um, and really that's, like the joy and the essence of life. So if I can leave with that, that's, that's the last part I would like to add. Yes. That's beautiful. Um, and that's, yeah, that's really the essence. And also I have been, um, really intrigued by growing a Wyoming tomato. Um, <laughs> you, you, you saying that jog my memory because we have the world's shortest growing season and I've had some really good tomato crops and I'm like, you know what, I need to start saving and get really strategic. Cause I bet I could make like a special Wyoming short season tomato. So Thank you for that reminder. I'm going to put that back on the list for this year. Oh my God. The list. Yeah. <laughs> the list. The never ending list. It's the never growing. ending list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. Tell us about your backyard food production. Uh, yeah. Is, is so it a recording or a summit? What is, what is a webinar? It's a, webinar. It's a, it's a free webinar. And um, I have spent a long, long time figuring out what is the fastest and easiest way for somebody who knows absolutely nothing and maybe they're older, or they're out of shape. How can they get producing a lot of food? I know calorie has been a bad word for a long time, but now it's about to become a unit of currency. Yeah. So how can you produce a lot of real substantial calories? And more importantly, the elephant in the room in the United States is malnutrition. How can you produce a lot of nutrition very, very quickly in a, you know, a small backyard size space? And so I distilled that all down into a free webinar and even if you're a, an experienced grower, a lot of people like to watch it just to go, oh, yeah, 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 that's right, or whatever. Um, so, yeah, so that's a free webinar at BackyardFoodProduction.com. Um, and then about every month, I'll host a live Q&A call. But once you've watched the webinar and signed up, we'll, we'll get you an email to let you know when we're doing the live Q&As. Um, yeah, I, um, you know, like you, Jill, we, we see this is such a great lifestyle. And um Unfortunately, a lot of people aren't going to come to it until there's a crisis. And, you know, I think we've got a crisis coming. So why not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The timing is now for sure. Um, yeah. And it's, I, I, I know of no other way to experience that full level of satisfaction than when you're just plugged into life. You know, you're, you're not being just a consumer. You're producing. You have your hands in the soil. It's a beautiful thing. So it really is. Like I said, yeah. I'm so grateful for that night at the Red Rock Community Center where, where that whole project failed. And, my yeah. life changed completely and it's, it's yeah. been the best thing I've ever done. It's been great. It's meant to be. Love those. I love those origin stories. It's powerful stuff. So Marjorie, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. This was a blast as always. Our conversations just always flow so well. I thoroughly enjoy it. So thanks for coming yeah. on everybody. Go check out backyardfoodproduction.com. I'll drop that in the show notes as well. Um, sign up for the free webinar. It's good stuff. So thanks friend. Thank you, we'll talk soon. Okay. Bye. <laughs>